much. Uh, thank you, Giselle. Thank you, Kim. I have to say, of, of whatever accomplishments I may have had, I think the one that I'm proudest of is all my wonderful students, and of whom Kim is one. Um, and there are several others in the room, so uh, I, I'm really particularly honored by that introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be giving this talk in honor of Michael Friedman. Wait, I have to get my talk. Um, I'll also be giving somebody else's talk in honor of Michael Friedman. <laughs> Challenging. Um, Um, I just realized that I had met Michael in the aftermath of September 11th when we worked together on a project. <coughs> so I have g benefited from his wit and wisdom for over 10 years now, and I have learned a great deal from him over the past decade. What I want to talk about today um, are opportunities <coughs> and challenges in the field of behavioral health in this new era of healthcare reform. And um, I'm going to go through a very short history of this and then talk about some new opportunities and challenges within uh, the Affordable Care Act in, in recent times. As Kim pointed out, Richard Frank and I wrote a book several years ago <laughs> about uh, the history of mental health policy in the United States. And, and a big theme of that book was that um, people with serious mental illness and people with mental illness behavioral health problems generally had gained a great deal from mainstream health care reform from the kind of work that happens in Washington at the 30,000 foot level and hardly seems to touch directly um, on people's lives uh, and on the advocacy that happens often at the grassroots level. But it turns out that those two things are very, very closely linked together and that changes in, the, in federal policy actually do redound um, at, at the level of individual people and individual programs um, at the local level. Much of our focus in the book was on the introduction of Medicare, Medicaid, and the Supplemental Security Income Program, uh, and the vast expansion of private insurance in the post-World War II period. And we show that these changes in mainstream policy, policies that were not specifically directed at people with mental illness, mental illness was not actually something that was talked about really in the development of those policies, had contributed to big improvements in the lives of people with mental health problems um, and in the opportunity of people to live outside of institutions. So let me just do this really, really fast. As, as Kim says, that's what I'm known for. Um, if you look at the earliest collection of data on this question back in 1956, you can see that almost all mental health financing at that point, over 80 percent, came either out of direct state funds, mostly funding to institutions, or what we call other federal funds, that is, federal funding not through insurance programs, but direct grants to institutions. By 1971, when Medicare and Medicaid had come into play, you can see Medicare had a small share there, Medicaid was growing, and private insurance, that black piece, also um, at those three pieces of insurance-based funding, very different kind of funding stream, added up to about a third of spending in 1971, and by 2001 had really jumped um, to, account to, to account for nearly half of mental health financing, which is now <laughs> happening through a much more diffuse financing stream through private insurance, which goes to people and not institutions, a really radical change in the way mental health was organized and advanced over this period. And if we look at the correlates of that change in financing, and I want you to keep that in the back of your head, because that's a lot of what we're going to talk about with the Affordable Care Act, um, what you see is uh, big improvements in the rates of treatment, people with and without disorders, uh, serious disorders getting treatment, uh, as, expand, as health insurance coverage expands, both in the private and public sector, uh, big reductions in out-of-pocket costs for people with mental illnesses, and improvements in the resources available to people with behavioral health problems uh, who lived outside of institutions. So we have uh, very vast expansions both in healthcare treatment and in opportunities for people. And just to <coughs> summarize that, and I said I'm going through this at lightning speed, I'm, I'm told that I can still receive royalties from my book if you choose to buy it. Uh, <laughs> this is too fast for you. Uh, so, so what you can see here that I think is quite important is that the share of people who were living in uh, institutions really shrank over this period, in part because resources became available that allowed at least some people to live out in the community. And so all of these mainstream programs, not really aimed at behavioral health, not really thinking about it, um, had really transformed the lives of people with mental illness over this period. From a, from a policy perspective, the story that Richard and I told in our book more or less ended after the uh, introduction of SSI in the early 1970s. So federal policy, federal mainstream health policy, kind of ended after Medicare and Medicaid, and disability policy after SSI. I mean, there were changes in SSI, good and bad, over that period, but the basic policy construction was in place by the early 1970s. 
But of course, if you looked at the movement towards comprehensive health insurance policy all around, it didn't end at that point. Both Presidents Nixon and Clinton put forward comprehensive health insurance reform proposals. And I wanted to spend one minute talking about those proposals because I think you can see how far the world of mental health has changed by contrasting what we were thinking about then and what we're, thinking, what we're talking about now. So President Nixon actually in 1974 in his health reform plan did include mental health benefits in his proposal. Um, but the plan benefits were very limited. So there were 30 days of inpatient mental hospital days that you could have, and there was a really kind of peculiar outpatient benefit, which was defined as the dollar amount enough to pay for 30 visits to a private practitioner, but you could only have 30 visits if you didn't see a private practitioner, but went instead to a community health center. If you did go to a private practitioner, you could only have 15 visits. So quite a complicated, um, design and actually one that was very controversial um, in the hearings that followed the introduction of this. Uh, there was really a question about whether, for example, psychologists could be paid under this program. Um, wouldn't that be terrible? Let alone psychiatric social workers and other people. So it was quite a controversial introduction, but Nixon did include in his plan um, a, a mental health benefit. Uh, things died after Clinton, uh, after Nixon. Uh, the plan died in the aftermath of Watergate and, and, and health, comprehensive health reform didn't get taken up again for nearly 20 years. But in the Clinton plan, uh, the mental health community was very active in trying to design a mental health benefit. And they worked very hard at it. It was a mental health work group. And if you read President Clinton's health reform plan, there is an entire chapter dedicated to the mental health benefit. Um, and it's a complex uh, plan that includes things like non-residential days, two non-residential days for one inpatient day, um, inpatient hospital and residential services, and outpatient psychotherapy services of different sorts um, related to the inpatient day, really a very um, uh, tied together, carefully thought through, all scientific kind of proposal. Um, but very, very, one thing that you can really see here is this is not a parity proposal at all. This is a proposal that treats mental health as a very distinct thing. And in the aftermath of the demise of the Clinton plan, the mental health advocacy and research communities, to their credit, I think, turn their attention to what was missing in the Clinton plan and what they sort of said to themselves. I don't know if they actually did, but, but certainly uh, one can retrospectively see it, is if we do this again, we don't want to be in the same place. And the way we're going to get out of that place is by addressing the parity issue once and for all. And I think the big, the big enormous contribution, and one for which I am daily grateful, is the efforts of the mental health community in the succeeding 15 years to really put parity in place um, and on the table. So, the Domenici Wellstone bill, which passed in 2008, uh, required that private health insurance plans uh, that offered mental health benefits provide those benefits at parity. There was actually a group, it's not only that the parity bill exists, which I think is really important that the legislation exists, but actually that the research that went into it, for example, the study of the Federal Employee Health Benefits Plan, which looked at the cost of providing mental health at parity, not only mean that the bill has a very firm grounding, but it's something that we continue to rely on when we get attacked which we do hourly or minutely um, <laughs> for the cost of whatever we're doing in health reform, we can say, look, you can do mental health parity and it doesn't need to break the bank. We've seen it, we've done it because the research base is really very, very strong there. So the mental health parity bill uh, passed in 2008 and that brings us to today, I got here pretty fast, um, <laughs> uh, the Affordable Care Act. So the Affordable Care Act, when people first read it, who worked in the behavioral health community, they were incensed. There's no chapter called Behavioral Health in the Affordable Care Act. There's no whole section called Mental Health in the Affordable Care, Care Act. Not like Nixon, not like Clinton. It's hard to find it. You have to use the search function in, uh, in uh, your PDF to find it. And the reason is because Behavioral Health in the Affordable Care Act is so comprehensively mainstreamed. It is so much in the mainstream that you don't have to look at it in a separate section. What do I mean by that? There is a set of 10 essential health benefits that every health plan must include. And on that list of benefits, which includes inpatient care, outpatient care, prescription drugs, one line is mental health and substance abuse services. It's just there. It's the same as prescription drugs or inpatient services or outpatient services. It doesn't need a whole chapter. And the reason it doesn't need a whole chapter is because parity was already in place. If parity were not already in place and we had to have the fight for parity now, it would be awful but we don't have to have the fight because it was already done. So behavior parity is there and the essential health benefits include mental health and substance abuse. And so everything in the Nixon plan and the Clinton plan is in those two sentences, the line that says mental health and substance abuse and the line that says parity will apply. 
You don't need a whole chapter to say that anymore because it's already been done. Um, there are other references, other places in the plan that talk about mental health, and I'll come back to that, um, around reinsurance, coordinated care, and home community-based services. But I think the key is to recognize that in this legislation, behavioral health policy is very much in the mainstream. Now, the most important piece of it, and I think the piece that sometimes everybody lose, loses sight of are the, Medicaid, are the expansions, the coverage expansions. So the act uh, extends Medicaid coverage to people with incomes below 133% of the federal poverty level, including childless adults. That makes much less difference in New York State, which uh, has already done much of that coverage expansion. But in many places in the country, childless adults are not eligible for Medicaid, no matter what their income is. And childless adults with low incomes are disproportionately people with mental illnesses. So this coverage expansion is tremendously important. There will also be health insurance exchanges and tax credits for people with incomes up to 400% of the federal poverty level. And, I'll, uh, and, if, so, and again, this is a population which is has a disproportionately high burden of mental illness. There are also employer requirements to offer coverage, and there's a requirement to obtain coverage, the, what do we call it, the, the individual responsibility requirement, known in the federal uh, court cases as the individual mandate. Um, which actually I think is an, a really important culture shifter. More than what it does in terms of penalties and gains and so on, what it really does is change people from thinking that health insurance is something that you get or don't get, depending on whether you can buy it or afford it now, to being something that is just part of life. Everybody has health insurance all the time, that's just the way it is. The way that your kids wear their seatbelts, which is another mandate. Your kids don't wear their seatbelts because we're waiting for the car, to, because we're waiting for the police to stop them. Your kids wear their seatbelts because that's what you do. Um, and so the individual mandate, I think, has that effect. Now, if you look at the data right now, <laughs> only uh, about 20% of people with serious mental illness, are, mental illness in this country are currently uninsured. So there's already a very, there's a very high burden of uninsurance in this population. And being uninsured, despite the, the vast network of state mental health uh, uh, policy that we have in the country, if you're uninsured and you have a serious mental illness, you are about half as likely to get services as somebody who has coverage. So you're not being treated, even though we have effective treatments for you, if you don't have insurance coverage. And this is going to make a very, so, so expanding coverage to all of these people, I think, um, will make a, a, a very important difference. Um, it, we anticipate that it will cover, Julie Garfield has some estimates, about four million people with serious mental illness who are currently uninsured will get coverage uh, through the Affordable Care Act. Now, Medicaid will play, the, how will this happen? Remember I said that the coverage expansion has both the Medicaid component and the component for people between 133 and 400%. Both of these components will be very important, uh, but I think an important thing to note here is that Medicaid will cover about a quarter of all people with mental, Ill, mental health and substance use disorders post-reform. Currently it currently covers about 12% of that population. So Medicaid's share of this population, Medicaid's responsibility for this population is going to increase quite dramatically in the post-reform uh, period. And there's also going to be a big increase in private insurance um, after, after reform takes place. I do want to point out, unfortunately, that, that the current estimates suggest that even after reform, about 15% of people with mental health and substance use disorders will remain uninsured. This is a very tough population to get to, and outreach and trying to get people signed up, I think is a really important task uh, for mental health agencies to, to engage in because it is the first step to getting people services to get them coverage. Now, it's not only coverage that people will get through the ACA, but also mental health coverage. And I think it's important to recognize what the Affordable Care Act does in the context of parity. Because parity, we sometimes think of parity as a fight on its own, but parity only matters if people have coverage and if that coverage includes mental health benefits. Because parity always said, if you don't offer mental health benefits at all, you don't have to offer them at parity, right? Now we have, you must have, coverage, the coverage must have benefits, and the benefits must be at parity. So all three pieces are in place. We can be pretty sure that the, the benefit will include mental health coverage. The coverage expansions, I think, are an extraordinary opportunity to improve the well-being of people with mental illness. And I think um, we focus a lot on people with serious mental illness, and that's a very important group, um, especially people who have bounced in and out of coverage because they may not qualify for SSI, and so their disability status is not uh, firmly in the, in the system, and so they're, they're, they're qualifying and not qualifying for Medicaid from time to time, people who are moving out of incarceration. So we worry a lot about the seriously mentally ill. I think that there's some really neat evidence about the potential benefits 
of this kind of coverage expansion for people who are less seriously mentally ill, for people who have milder problems of depression and anxiety. And there's this really neat study that I'm trying to bring to everyone's attention because I think it's so cool, um, that was done based uh, uh, around the Oregon Medicaid lottery. Oregon decided to expand their Medicaid program and they didn't have enough slots. So they did it by lottery, which you might think of as unethical, but from a researcher perspective is just dynamite, right? Uh, so they did it by randomized lottery. And so you can compare people who got Medicaid and people who didn't get Medicaid in Oregon. And if you look at the people who were eligible for this lottery, about half of them had a positive screen for depression. And they spent on average only 18 days a month in what they reported as good mental health. These are not people who qualified on the basis of disability. These are just ordinary plain vanilla people who needed Medicaid, low income people in Oregon who needed Medicaid. If you look at those who qualified for the health, who, who got randomized, got, won the lottery and got mental health coverage, you see that they had a big increase in visits, 55% increase in visits, a 15% increase in prescription drugs, and a substantial reduction in depression, and an in increase in mental health, healthy, me health, good mental health days, very, very quickly after receiving coverage. Now, why would that be happening? I think there are two things at work, and I think they're both important for us to think about as mental health policy people. Um, one is just the secure. One is the p potential that they're getting treatment. So you got you get coverage, you get visits, you get prescriptions. These things work, and people get better. The second piece I think is also really important, which is the security of knowing that you can get treatment if you need treatment may in itself improve people's mental health. No. Uh, it's sort of an element of self-efficacy, recognizing that you can do something about the problem that you have may also be beneficial. But that will only work if people do believe that they can get treatment if they need it. So access to care really is highlighted by this kind of evidence. Of course, in mental health, every opportunity comes with a challenge. Um, and uh, in this case, I think the challenge has to do with governance, and this is a point that Commissioner Hogan has made many, many times in the past. As more of the financing for mental health services moves into the Medicaid pot, What's going to happen to the advocacy and governance role of the mental health commissioners in state and city governments around the country? Uh, as considerable new federal monies flow in through Medicaid, how are we going to be sure that the ancillary services, which are often not covered by Medicaid, will continue to be provided? As the number of uninsured drops and there is a, a way to finance them in other ways, how are we going to make sure that some services remain for this population? Um, so what, what, do, what happens within health insurance and what happens within all of the other services that, that fall under the domain of the mental health uh, world? Because health insurance is unlikely to cover everything that really is needed to support people living in the community. So how are we going to uh, work that out? And I think especially for the population that is not going to be the Medicaid expansion population, but those just above that threshold, how are we going to make sure that we can align all of those activities together? So that's the, 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 the coverage piece. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the delivery system reform, um, which is the other really big component of the Affordable Care Act. It's not only a coverage expansion, but there are really significant changes in the delivery system on both the Medicare and Medicaid sides. And I'm just going to skip through these very quickly. Um, one is the opening of an office of the duals in the Medicare program uh, between Medicare and Medicaid. So there are a lot of people who qualify for both Medicare and Medicaid. A disproportionate share of those people have serious and persistent mental illness. This new office is intended to provide states with opportunities to be innovative in the treatment of this group of people and to bring to mix together both Medicare and Medicaid funds. And I think it's a great chance for innovative um, policy making at the state level. Um, there are new home and community-based service options, we can talk about those later, that are available to state Medicaid programs to expand the services available to help people live in the community instead of needing, requiring institutionalized care. And then accountable care organizations, which are, I think, the, significant, the most significant delivery system reform idea in the Affordable Care Act, which is really an idea that says a group of providers can come together, be held accountable for their, for their performance, and share in any savings Medicare realize. So there's money there for a, a group of providers who comes up with ways to organize care more effectively and to be held accountable for the care they deliver. We are finalizing those regulations, and I think they're supposed to be out by the end of the week, although don't hold me to that. I don't know. Um, but the, just to give you a sense of what's likely to be in them, the notice of proposed rulemaking, which we released last <coughs> spring, had a depression measure in the set of measures for which provider organizations would be accountable. And I think another area of mental health policy research and advocacy will be to expand the set of mental health measures for which we are going to hold providers accountable, because that's the basis on which we can expand and change payment within the Medicare system. 
probably the most important health reform, uh, delivery system reform within uh, the Affordable Care Act with respect to people with mental health and substance abuse disorders is the Medicaid Health Homes option, which is now available to states um, and provides enhanced federal matching payments. Uh, and people with serious mental illness are one of the groups that is uh, singled out as being eligible for this new option, which is supposed to integrate behavioral health and community services together and provide people with this more comprehensive um, kind of benefit. All right, so expansions are gonna do a lot of good. But of course, there will still be challenges. Challenges, every, every opportunity comes with its challenges. And I think that in mental health, those challenges really fall into two big buckets. Um, social services and supports and impairment. So social services and supports, this comes from our book as well. Um, if you look at that little red bar at the top, on the one hand, fewer people are institutionalized. But on the other hand, there are more people who are either homeless or incarcerated. And that is a serious problem, one that we have not really licked yet and that, one that is gonna require continuing attention. So I think that red bar is really a very depressing bar and, and one that we need to really continue to think about. But another depressing bar, and one that I think I learned about also from Commissioner Hogan, um, is the growth in functional impairment among people with mental health problems. So we have become better over time in treating mental illness. We have better tools at our disposal, but what we have not succeeded in doing as effectively as we should is reducing the functional impairment that comes along with mental health and substance use disorders. Um, and so the share of people with SSI who report that they have a mental or who are, who are on SSI because of a mental illness or a substance use disorder has been going up, which is kind of, I mean, in an era of effective treatment should not be happening. Why is this happening? I think one possible explanation is that the nature of the work uh, of the labor market is such that people with mental illness have more trouble fitting in than they did in the past. And so these things are, these conditions are more disabling, but we can't just sit back and rely on that. We need to do something about it. We need to think about how we're going to, in the context of recovery, help people <coughs> remain in the workforce, help people uh, continue to function. And I think this problem is really disturbing for adults. Um, it's equally disturbing for kids where you can see very much the same pattern uh, of an increase in the share of kids on SSI um, who report some sort of a uh, mental health problem. So I think there, there are real challenges here too. But just like every opportunity comes with a challenge, in mental health every challenge comes with an opportunity. And one of the really cool things that Richard and I found in our book is that mental health um, it puts the lie to the idea that you can't improve things in the healthcare sector without spending a lot of money. While the rest of the healthcare sector has grown as a share of the GDP, mental health spending as a share of the GDP has been pretty much steady for a very long period of time. And you might ask why on earth has that been the case? And the answer is different in every decade. In the earliest decade, I think in 1970s, this was a shift from institutional to community care and from more costly to providers to less costly providers. We had this flood of psychologists and social workers and counselors so that you didn't have to go to a really high priced psychiatrist to be able to get mental health care. And then subsequently we have um, changes that came about because of um, uh, uh, managed behavioral health care and the, the potential to expand services while titrating the right services to the right people. So we have this real change. So the question is, what's next? How are we gonna control mental health costs in the future? And I actually just wanna like flag one thing, just cause I had to end on something different. Um, uh, and that is uh, what, what my friends on the science and data policy side call the patent cliff. Um, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but much of the increase in mental health spending over the past decade, we've got the service use under control, but prescription drug spending has been very much out of control. And uh, psychotropic medication spending has really been a major factor in escalating me Medicaid mental health costs over the past decade. Between 2008 and 2014, a very large number of the really costly uh, antipsychotic psychotropic meds are going off patent. And estimates from the literature suggest that when they go off patent, their prices will fall by 80%. Mm. Okay, so right now, these psychotropic drugs account for 18% of all Medicaid drug spending. An 80% reduction in that is roughly 15% you know, of Medicaid drug spending that go that's going back into the pocket of Medicaid directors because these things are going off path. <coughs> this is gonna happen over the next five years, whether we do anything about it or not. So this is the moment to try and think about how to direct those dollars and, that, and those resources um, to, to, provide, to fill in gaps rather than just being kind of soaked up in the general ooze of healthcare spending. Um, so there are, 
are some ex exceptional opportunities, and now I think it's the time to prepare for them. Most of the things that are going to happen in this story happen in the period between about 2012 and 2014. So we are ideally positioned to think about policy and advocacy that will move things in the right direction there. Um, this is the time uh, to, to, to prepare for that change in the flow of funds. And I think New York City and New York State are uniquely well positioned to do that because of the excellent commissioners and the excellent talent we have here. Um, and so I'm looking forward to the comments of commissioners Hogan, Sanchez, and Farley um, about how we can, we at the federal level can support state and local efforts. Thanks.